Today we are talking about Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation. We've learned in a previous chapter about gravity, and we understand that gravity is a force that acts on all objects on Earth, and it pulls objects downwards towards the Earth's surface. When Newton initially discovered this concept of gravity, we learned and his focus was primarily on how things on Earth were being affected. Naturally so, right? That's the world he was living in. But as scientists continued to investigate and question the behaviors of this gravitational force, and they started to expand and look in larger spectrums, not just what is happening physically here on Earth, we found that gravity is actually universal. Meaning this concept of this force of attraction between the earth and the apple happens on a bigger scale as well. So when we talk about things like the sun and the earth and how the earth orbits the sun, that comes back to this universal gravitational force. So we should know that in general, the sun is the center of our orbit, and we should have learned from the previous chapter that objects in motion tend to want to stay in motion, and we should know by now that the earth is in motion. Our earth is actually moving, and so according to Newton's first law, if the earth is traveling this direction, this is the direction that the earth should want to travel, and it should want to stay at the same speed in the same direction. And so we should be drifting in a straight line through space. However, we also know that that is not the reality. So the question is, why? Why are we not continuing to move on this straight line path? Well, the sun is applying a force onto us that is pulling it, pulling us towards the sun. This is a gravitational force coming from the sun that is being applied onto the earth. We should also know from Newton's third law that if the sun is applying a force onto the earth, well, then that means the earth is applying a force onto the sun. And the magnitude of that force is going to be the same, but it's just going to be in the opposite direction. So the sun pulls on the earth, the earth pulls on the sun. We're going to take this concept now and we're going to focus on the earth, but we're going to talk about the relationship between the earth and the moon. See, this is a concept that we should understand because we understand Newton's third law. But what evidence do we have that this is actually taking place? Because this is not a physical contact. We do not have two objects pressing against each other the way that we would easily recognize. So how do we know for sure that the earth is pulling on the moon and the moon is pulling on the earth. Well, for that, we are going to look at how the earth is manipulated because of the moon's force. So Newton's third law says if the earth pulls on the moon, the moon pulls on the earth. It is a shared force. It is the same force for both of, ob both of our objects they're going to be equal magnitudes. They're just going to act on each other. So this is just Newton's third law, right? So how did scientists decide that this is a true statement? How did we know for sure this is happening? Well, if we look at this illustration here, you can see that it's talking about the different um, seasons of high tide and low tides throughout the earth. Well, if you're not familiar with the phrase, we're talking about how large or small the waves are in the ocean. In this illustration, I want us to focus on the moon illustrated here on the left. For the first illustration, we have the moon and we're going to relate how the moon is affecting the ocean that is closest to it. So this body of water here is what we're going to talk about first. If we are talking about the distance between the moon and the earth, well, there's lots of different spots on the earth we could talk about, right? So let's focus first on that individual spot. Relatively speaking, this is a pretty close distance. So if we are studying how large the waves are in this particular body of water, because the moon is lined up so that it's very close to the earth, 
the effects of the force coming from the moon are going to be magnified. It's going to be a really strong force at this location because of that relatively close distance. Now, at the same time, if we were to look at the distance that the moon is from this location to our bodies of water over here, this is a different spot on the earth. And so it is at a different distance and that is going to cause the force experienced at that location to be different simply because it's a different distance away. So if we look at how far the moon is from this particular area of water, that is a greater distance. So what we find is that the effects on the water, the pull from the moon is weaker. And so as a result of that, the waves in the ocean are smaller compared to the area in blue where it is a closer distance, the force is going to be stronger there and that is going to cause larger waves. So this is our evidence that the, the moon is indeed pulling on the earth. Now, in general, you're going to need to be able to answer questions about this, okay? So generally speaking, objects that are farther away in this case, our example is still the earth, but really our questions don't have to involve the earth. Our questions can involve any two objects. So if the distance between those two objects is a large distance, then generally speaking, there will be a weak force of attraction between those two objects because they are far apart. If we then compare that to the force between two objects that are closer to each other, now we are going to see that the force is greater. That force of attraction is going to be stronger because they are simply closer together. And so these are conceptual questions that you are going to need to be able to understand how to answer. Now, we could also talk about the difference in the masses of our object. If we are talking about the earth and the moon, what if the size of the moon changed? What if the moon became larger so that the mass increased? Or what if the moon became smaller so that the mass decreased? Well, manipulating the mass of of one of our objects is going to affect what that force value is. Manipulating how far apart our objects are or the distance between our objects, that's going to affect how strong the force between them is. So when we talk about this main idea, I want you to just make it really simple. If the moon were to grow, if it were to increase in mass, well, that's going to make the force stronger. So we would say that force and mass are directly related because increasing the mass increases the force. If we were to talk about the um, difference in the distances, if I have an object that is moved closer to another object, it is going to experience a greater force just because they are closer together. So increasing um, the distance, sorry, did I say that backwards? Increasing the distance, so if we make the distance between them bigger, well, that's going to create a weaker force. And then if I take two objects and I put them closer together, decreasing the distance is going to give me a stronger force. Put them closer together, the force of attraction between them is stronger. That's probably a common sense statement. So can we then take those manipulations and conclude from that that we are going to have an inverse relationship between the force and the distance. So generally speaking, that's a concept I want you to grasp. And then as we get to the end of our lesson, we're going to talk about how we can be a little bit more specific with how much weaker or how much stronger based off of what they're asking us to change for our setup. In order for us to do math, we need a formula. So our equation is listed here on the left. We have F is equal to G M M over D squared. In this formula, notice that we have lowercase m for our mass. We're still going to measure that in kilograms. And then we have a 1 and a 2 subscript because we have two objects, right? It was the moon and the earth. It was the sun and the earth. It was whatever two random objects that we're discussing, right? So in 
our equation. We have mass listed twice, and here they are just identifying, we are gonna call this first M the mass of the first object, and the second M the mass of the second object. When I write this on the board, I will often choose to leave those subscripts out. Um, unfortunately, I have found that, especially in recent years, I have more and more students that are just confused by those subscripts, and it's easier for them to just understand, I have two objects, so I have two masses, and they just know to put in the two numbers. So whether or not I write the subscripts for object one and object two, that's why we essentially have two Ms in our formula. D is our distance, and we still need that to be in meters. And the formula says that we have to square it. Please be careful. Remember to square your distance in all calculations. Okay. Then we're going to take a second, and we're going to look at this letter G. This is a capital G. Now, in the past, we have used lowercase g, which was negative 9.8 meters per second squared because this represented the acceleration created by Earth's gravitational force. This is not the same G. This is a capital G and notice the numbers are different. So please make sure that you do not get the two confused. In this chapter, you are going to need to know that big G is the universal gravitational constant and you're going to want to write this number down for you to reference whenever you are performing calculations where you need to actually determine the force in newtons, the mass in kilograms, distance in meters. When we are looking at the illustrations that I have and their corresponding formulas, I just want to throw it out there because you may see this equation expressed in a few different ways in the future. In this picture here on the bottom, they have simply taken our masses and they've made them capital M's instead of lowercase m's. I am actually completely okay with you doing this on your paper as well. M is only designated for mass for us. So capital M, lowercase m, it's still just going to be a mass. So if you want to switch it up and maybe write your formula so that it is MM, so that you have your two separate notations, that's perfectly fine. If we look at this illustration, in our denominator, they have changed the D to an R. So I want to make it very clear, this chapter is really about things going in circles. This is our circular motion chapter. We will be talking about things moving in a circle. And so the reason for this particular equation and how that relates to circles goes back to my opening comment about why the earth doesn't go flying off in a straight line. That pull, that force from the sun is ultimately going to cause the earth to turn. And we just keep turning until we eventually make a circle and then we just keep going round and round. So in the next lesson, we'll come back to this and we'll talk more about how circular motion is created. But for right now, I want you to understand that if the question is referring to something like the earth that is following a circular pattern where the center of that circle is the sun, well, how far apart these two things are if you look at my drawing, oh yeah, that's the radius of my circle. So this equation has an R in the denominator because this equation is talking specifically about the gravitational force between objects where one object is orbiting the other. It is still a distance. It is still in meters. Um, I will keep it a D in our equation whenever we are dealing with this formula. But as we begin talking about circles, it might be presented as the radius of the circle. And it will just be your job to understand if um, we need to make any adjustments to our values based off of our circumstances. Okay, so that's just going to be part of your critical thinking when you are reading over a story and just having an idea of what is happening. Here, I have a hypothetical problem. Let's say that we read through a word problem and I've listed my variables. Notice that I have identified mass of object one, mass of object two. With this information, I should then be able to plug my numbers into the equation and calculate the force value. G is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. That probably will not be provided for you in your word problems in this lesson. So what I want you to do is just understand when we're dealing with gravitational force, you're just going to have to go and add that 
in the list and you will be responsible for knowing when you need to use this number. Okay, if I ask you to grab your calculator and calculate your force, you should all be able to give me the same correct final answer. So here's what it would look like if we have all of the numbers substituted into the equation where they belong. I have a separate video that I would love for you to go and watch where I talk about the details about how we're going to type this in. I understand that many of you are very capable of using your calculator. However, we are dealing with several numbers in scientific notation throughout this series of assignments, and we're going to be solving for variables other than F, so we're also going to have to do some algebra. The nitpicky... Um, does my calculator need a parenthesis? Does it not? Do I use the times 10 and the caret or do I not? All of those things are going to come from experience. If you would please go and watch the other video that I have posted for you where I talk just about the calculator use, hopefully you won't have any issues with your math problems because the calculator will be explained thoroughly there. If you take this and type it in your calculator, you should come up with a rounded answer of 4.2 times 10 to the negative 24. Hopefully you actually grabbed your calculator, you typed that in, and you did get this answer. If you didn't, please seek assistance so that you know how to get this answer and how to use your calculator correctly in the future. What I wanna focus on with you today is how do we answer these questions about our object and how, I'm sorry, our objects and how manipulating their location or their masses affects our gravitational force. When you get questions like this, we are not asking you to solve for the actual value for my force in Newtons. Instead, I'm simply asking, what is the effect if I manipulate my system? If I take my objects and I move them farther apart, it's going to be weaker. Yes, we've addressed common sense tells me this, but how much weaker? Well, if I move it so that they're twice as far, is it going to be half of the original force? Or is it going to be a fourth? Is it going to be a third? You're going to need to know the specifics. If you look at the answer choices that I have here, I have half the force in words, I have one fourth F, either one is acceptable. Some people might say one fourth of the original force value. That works too. The idea here is that you can comprehend that it's gonna be a lesser value. We are decreasing the force because we're dividing by some number, okay? If we are talking about taking our um, masses and they want us to increase our masses, well, if I take the mass of one object and I triple it, well, then my force is going to be greater. Yes, how much greater? Well, if I took my mass and I multiplied it so that it's three times bigger, then my final answer is going to be three times bigger, right? So I would say that it's three times the original. It is triple the force. It is 3F. So if you notice, I have my answers written once again in words to tell me that it's more force, specifically double the force, triple the force, quadruple the force, or I can express it with a whole number times F. So you are going to be asked questions where these are the types of answers that you are going to give me. So the last thing that I wanna do with you today is just talk about how am I supposed to know what those numbers are? Well, for some of you, it's just gonna be factual. Force and mass are directly proportional. So if I tell you that we are increasing the mass of an object and I make the mass two times bigger, it's going to make my force two times bigger because that's what it means to be directly proportional. They're going to both increase together or they're going to both decrease together. If I ask you to manipulate the distance, we have to be careful. The formula says that I have to take my distance and I have to square it. This should be the only thing 
that makes answering distance questions tricky. I expect that you understand that if I am increasing my distance, I'm dividing by a larger number, so my force is going to overall be smaller. It is going to be a fraction answer. It's going to be a weaker force. It decreases the force value. I believe that you guys can comprehend that. But if I tell you to double the distance because the formula says that I have to square it, I am going to have an inverse relationship because increasing the distance decreases the force. But I've got to use that word squared as part of my relationship descriptive. Please be mindful of this when you are asked the question about what type of relationship um, the variables have on your quiz and your test. So what does that actually look like in execution? Here's what I would like for you to do. I would like for you to make every number a one, assuming that it's the same value in the first scenario compared to the second scenario, it's just gonna be a one. If we want you to take the mass and double it, well, instead of being a one, it'll be a two. If we want you to triple it, instead of being a one, it'll be a three. If we want you to cut it in half, instead of being a one, it'll be a one half. If you can follow that very simple logic, then answering these questions becomes really easy, just fraction math. Can you just put the numbers into the fraction? And then can you simplify the fraction? That's really all you need to be able to do. So we are setting the precedent that everything starts off as a one. And then we manipulate the equation in order to show how they're asking me to change my setup. So here I have a question where they want me to double the mass. So my original equation says that I have G times M times M divided by D squared. If the formula wants me to take my mass and double it, well, what they're asking me to do is they're asking me to take this number and multiply it by two. So ultimately I'm going to multiply the whole thing by two and my number is going to be two times bigger. So you can see two times as much, right? Or we might express that as two times F, which means two times whatever the force originally was. Now, for those of you who like a little bit more concrete instruction, here's how this would look. My force, is going to be, well, I didn't change G, so that stays a one, that number will never change. I am changing the mass of one of my objects and I'm not changing the mass of the other. So one mass stays a one, but the other mass has to change because they asked me specifically to double it, I'm gonna make the second mass a two. They did not ask me to change my distance, so that stays a one, and the equation says I have to square that. So now I'm just going to simplify my fraction. Multiply across the top, you get two. Multiply across the bottom, you get one. Two over one says that this fraction simplifies to a two. Now please don't be confused. This is not an answer of two newtons. This is saying that after I've manipulated my equation, I am ultimately multiplying by the number two. So this is how I know that my final answer says that it's going to be twice the original force value, or if I write it as 2F, if they tell me in the question that the original force was 10 newtons, I'm literally gonna say two times the original force, 2F, it doubled. If the question says, hey, what is the new force value now that I understand that it's doubled, well now I'm gonna take this force, I'm gonna put in the original value of 10 newtons. I'm gonna double it, cause that's what I said the math told me to do. And I'm gonna have a new value of 20 newtons. So I don't actually need to know what the original numbers are. I just need to know that I took the mass and doubled it. It's gonna make it two times the original force value. If they wanna know the actual new value, as long as they told me the original value, that's a really simple problem, okay? For this question, they are asking me to double my distance. So what I did here is I kept everything a one, a one, a one. Those didn't change, right? You can see that all here. But this time they wanted me to take my distance and instead of making it a one, they wanted me to make it a two. 
But then the formula says I have to square that. So this is why I have two squared in my denominator. From here, I'm going to simplify my fraction. Multiply across the top, I get one. Two squared gives me four. So I'm left with a simplified fraction of one over four. This means doubling the distance is going to take my force and make it one fourth of the original. It's gonna be a quarter of what it was originally, whatever that number happens to be. In this question, they didn't ask me what the new force was. They just said, hey, what does it do? The effect of doubling the distance is that it's one fourth of the original force. Again, this is not one fourth Newtons, okay? We're not measuring in Newtons. We are just simply saying how the new value would compare to the original. And so these are the types of questions that you're being asked on the back half of your worksheet. So the front half of the worksheet hopefully is very simple and straightforward. We just need to be able to take our calculator and plug these numbers in properly. The back half of our worksheet, they're asking us questions about these relationships. Do I know that it's direct or inverse and what does that mean? What does that look like? Is it a whole number? Is it a fraction? Well, if it increased, it should be a whole number times F. If it decreased, it's going to be a fraction times F. Okay, generally speaking, I should be able to comprehend that. Now we're going to say, if we tell you specifically, double this, triple that, cut it in half, make it one third of the original, now what does it do? So now you need to be able to manipulate the numbers to give me a more specific answer of how much bigger or how much smaller. If the question then asks, what is the new force value? Now we take this extra step that I explained here. 